Well, I'm very excited to be here this evening. Um, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I saw The Sound of Music uh, when I was seven years old. <laughs> I've been in love with it ever since. And when I was seven, then I went home and I found out my father had an LP and I went to play the LP. And of course the LP was from the stage show, which as many of you probably know is substantially different. So I started wrestling with the problems of adaptation between genre when I was just a young child. And it probably condemned me to the life that I've lived ever since. <laughs> Um, what I'd like to do today is talk a bit about the two major writers here, well, at least for the score, Oscar Hammerstein II and uh, Rich, Richard Rodgers, take a brief um, look at each one of their shows, very brief, and then spend more time, obviously, on The Sound of Music. Um, but uh, Oscar Hammerstein II, as you can see here, lived 65 years. Not a long life, he died of stomach cancer in 1960. In fact, the stomach cancer was diagnosed and surgery was performed at just about the time that uh, Sound of Music was going into rehearsal. So this is certainly the last show that this fascinating man ever worked on. He was born into a theatrical family. His grandfather, Oscar Hammerstein I, that was his namesake, actually started out as an immigrant and a cigar maker. But he made a fortune in the cigar industry, and he got interested in theaters. And this is the man who built the Hippodrome, the enormous theater that was there in New York in the early 20th century. And his two sons, Arthur and William, both went into theater. And his, this man's father didn't want him to go into theater because he thought it was not the life for anybody because it was too much work and you lost a lot of money on it. His grandfather made and lost a couple of fortunes during the course of his life of putting on opera and theater in New York. Um, but, you know, it was in his blood, as we would expect in this family of theater people. And he started out as a stage manager. He went to Columbia. And not long after he became a stage manager, he started working with Otto Harbach, which was uh, rewriting the name Otto Hauerbach, um, who was writing books, that is, the, the script, if you will, for shows, the dialogue which ties together the lyrics, and lyrics um, from the late 19-teens. And he actually worked on 10 shows. Um, with Harbach, and during the course of that period also started working himself on several shows during the 1920s. Um, in fact, there were a couple of uh, fairly well-known uh, operettas, like The New Moon, that um, Hammerstein wrote the lyrics for. Um, Showboat, of course, was, you know, that is the most famous show still from the 1920s. In some ways, it's the beginnings of what we would call the musical play as a genre, because, of course, it does tell a serious story. The music goes a long ways to helping to tell that story. So this integration between music and plot, which was not as precise in the 1920s as it is later, we see going on in Oklahoma. And, of course, this, well, a lot of this was this man's work. I mean, musicals were usually written in a matter of, of weeks and months in the 1920s. It wasn't unusual for George Gershwin to have three shows on Broadway at the same time because they wrote one and they just went on to another. Um, it took them a year to adapt Showboat because they were trying to do something quite different. Um, again, telling a very serious story and making sure that the music was really helping to tell the story. It wasn't just a bunch of popular songs that were tied in. When you consider this man worked on Showboat, and then of course, in some ways, sort of takes the musical play to the next step in working with Hammer, with Rogers um, from 1943 to 1960, um, you're looking at one of the most important figures in the history of the Broadway musical. And he never wrote a note of music, um, but he had very strong feelings about trying to get the score to help to tell the story. He worked with a number of Broadway's famous figures. Vincent Humans, we know it's pronounced that way because once Cole Porter, Porter rhymed humans with humans. Um, Rudolf Frimmel, Sigmund Romberg, two of the masters of the uh, operetta. Jerome Kern, obviously, with whom he wrote Showboat, and a number of other shows in the 1930s, but nothing uh, that was anywhere near as popular as Showboat had been. And then, of course, starting with Richard Rodgers, they formed their partnership in 1942, and Oklahoma were, were opened in 1943. Lyricists do have styles. Some are very hard to describe. Some are not. But, you, you know, in some ways, you kind of have the ones who are extremely clever, lots of interesting rhymes, maybe even internal rhymes within the phrases. Um, you know, words getting used different ways as you're going along through, I mean, Sondheim comes to mind when you're thinking about something like that. In an earlier period, you're thinking about people like Larry Hart, um, to a certain extent, Ira Gershwin. That's not Hammerstein. 
Hammerstein's wrote, you know, he, he, he simple emotional songs, taking human emotions and setting them in a way that almost anyone can understand. They were very clean lyrics, very well rhymed. And it's not that he couldn't be clever, he could be, but that wasn't his style. And actually, of course, as many of you probably know, he became a mentor to Stephen Sondheim. Um, starting in the 1940s, and one Sondheim, who he brought, who brought a lot of his stuff to, to Hammerstein, Sondheim came in with a, so, a song like Hammerstein wrote, and Hammerstein said, that's not you, be you, that's me, don't write like me, I know you, that's not you. Um, so, you know, but he had a great deal of influence over the process and over the way shows got written, and again, into this, you know, this dive into the notion of integrating every aspect of a show in a way that opera had been, much opera had been for a long time. You just go back to the earlier musical comedy, they didn't really care um, a lot of the times. A song introduction might be, hey, Naomi, sing that great song you learned from Robert. Well, you can sing anything that, and, you know, that's, um, but, uh, so Hammerstein, after Showboat, as he said, he keeps working with Kern. Um, there are some show, I mean, uh, some fairly well-known shows, but again, nothing quite like Showboat. Um, he did work in Hollywood during the 1930s. He didn't like it very much. Um, the writers out there simply didn't have as much power over their products as, you know, the studios did what they wanted to, and often a musical, you know, would have five songs, six songs, whereas a Broadway show would have 15 or 20. And um, he wasn't the only person who went out there. Rogers was another who just didn't really feel like, I mean, they did the work and they made a lot of money at it, but it wasn't something that, uh, <clears throat> that interested them as much in the long run. Again, considering this man's um, importance in the development of musical play, he's got to be considered one of the most important creators in the history of Broadway. Rogers, um, his career starts a lot earlier. He works for a quarter of a century with Larry Hart, Lorenz Hart, as his partner. Um, they met and started working together when Rogers was all of 17. Um, Hammerstein, of course, was, uh, he actually pronounced it Hammerstein. I, I'm sorry, I, I've written six books on Leonard Bernstein. And of course, Bernstein insisted on Bernstein. So I seem to be Stein instead of Steen. But he was actually, he pronounced his name Hammerstein. Anyway, they're both, uh, you know, uh, from Jewish families. Rogers, a rather different one. He was from a German Jewish family, where Hammerstein's family, of course, was from the Russian Empire. Uh, but Rogers comes from a family of a New York physician. You know, he didn't come from, they, they both came from, you know, very, very comfortable backgrounds. And Rogers got seduced by the music of Jerome Kern when he was all 14 years old and decided he wanted to be a writer of Broadway musicals. Um, and he meets Hart in 1919 when he's 17 years old and they form their partnership. Um, uh, Rogers had studied some of the Institute of Musical Art in New York as a teenager um, and he was a good pianist. He wasn't a pianist quite like uh, you know, George Gershwin, and one could probably say was a great pianist, but Rogers could perform his music and did. Um, as far as Larry Hart was concerned, Kern's shows were wonderful, and they wanted to write shows like Jerome Kern. Jerome Kern was a huge influence on anyone born in the next generation who was writing on Broadway. Gershwin also pointed to Kern as his biggest influence. They started working in amateur shows. There's a lot of that going on in New York in the time. Um, and they contributed to Broadway production starting around 1920. The first thing they contributed to was called The Poor Little Ritz Girl, and they wrote a score for it. And they went out of town, and they didn't go out of town with it. When it came back, it had a whole pile of other songs in it. Um, Fields and others had lost, had lost faith in the young, young men's work, and they found some of their songs in that production. So their first real success um, was a Garrick Gaieties in 1925. It was a review that was supposed to just run through the summer, but it was so good, it actually ran for six months. And six months back then, in 1925, that was a good solid run. These days, of course, if a show runs six months, you lose everything. But uh, Broadway economics are a totally different thing than they were 100 years ago. Uh, Works on with Lou Fields. Herbert Fields, the son, wrote a book for some of the book for some of their early shows. Garrett Gaieties had the song Manhattan. I'll take Manhattan and Staten Island too. It's their first hit. With Hart, he wrote 30 shows. 
between 1925 and the early 1940s. Again, you know, it's these days, most creators aren't going to get a show on Broadway more than every four or five years because it takes a whole lot longer to get these things financed and everything and rehearsed and ready to go these days. Um, some of the famous ones, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, obviously based upon Mark Twain's uh, novel. On Your Toes, that was Roger's first experience with using a lot of ballet, and it starred Ray Bolger, of course, the uh, Scarecrow fame. Babes in Arms, couple of their biggest hits, My Funny Valentine, The Lady is a Tramp, Pal Joey. Pal Joey was an edgy musical. Um, it demonstrated, you know, we, we give Rodgers and Hammerstein credit for all kinds of things in the coming of the musical play, but he was starting down this road with Rodgers. I mean, um, pal Joey, the major character, Joey, he's a stinker. You wouldn't want him as a neighbor or friend, a boss, or anybody working for you. Um, and, you know, the Brooks Atkinson, who was the big New York Times reviewer of the day, I mean, when he was... Uh, I mean, his review of this said something along the line, how do you get sweet water from a foul well? I mean, there'd been nobody like this as the lead of a musical. So Pal Joey is already kind of, it's you know, doing a good job of starting down this role of the musical play, not just musical comedy. Final show together was By Jupiter. Um, Larry Hart was, uh, he was a troubled individual. He was gay at a time when being gay was a very difficult thing to be. He apparently spent his life worried that his mother knew about it. Most of his friends figured she probably did, but uh, he, he had a severe drinking problem on top of that. And he actually died in 1943 with a completely pickled liver. Um, but he was a genius. Rogers would write the music first. He'd get Hart with him. He'd play the so, tune a few times, and within an hour, <laughs> Hart would write the, most, the wittiest lyrics you could possibly imagine that worked at two or three levels. I mean, just fabulous stuff. Um, the man's grasp on a language, when you consider his first language was German, it's quite astonishing, but his grasp of English and how to write lyrics from it was just absolutely wonderful. Um, so Hart had the opportunity, excuse me, Rogers was approached by the Theater Guild, which was broke. It was a Broadway producing organization. They were trying to get a show that we need to start, finally make some money. And they owned the rights to Green Grow the Lilacs as a musical. It was a play by Lynn Riggs, which they had produced in 1931 and part of that contract had given them musical rights for it. So they didn't have to pay anything extra for it. And they go to Rogers, and Rogers thinks it's a, you know, looks like a pretty good idea for a show. He takes it to Hart, and Hart says, I don't like the idea, and I don't want to work on it. So 24-year partnership is coming to an end there. Um, he'd already talked to Hammerstein. Hammerstein had actually offered to write lyrics for the last show if Hart wasn't able to finish it because Hart was not in good shape at this point. And um, uh, so he, uh, Rogers just said, well, thank you, Larry. Thank, you know, and I, I'm, I'm going to work with Oscar Hammerstein. So this is the beginnings of Rogers and Hammerstein. Hammerstein had already read the play and loved it and thought it could turn into a good musical. Um, I, don't, I don't mean to demean Larry Hart in any way. As I said, the man was an ingenious lyric writer, and Rogers had his own drinking problem. But uh, um, the partnership had just become untenable for Rogers, who really was an absolute workaholic and couldn't imagine not being able to be working on shows all the time. So Rogers and Hammerstein were born um, as, as, a, as a working group. Um, with Hart, Rogers wrote the music first. Hart added the lyrics. Hammerstein wanted to work the other way. And most of their songs, that's what they did. And the reason Hammerstein wanted to do that is it's a lot harder to add lyrics to a pre-existing tune than it is to write the lyrics and say, here, write a tune for this. You can do whatever you want with the lyrics if you're writing them. If you're trying to set them to a tune, you're a lot more limited as to what you could do. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it takes a lot more imagination to figure out what you want to say with the song. And they say, since they really wanted to go the musical play route and wanted to be writing songs that really helped tell the story, um, Hammerstein thought it was important um, to write the lyrics first. That was fine with Rogers. Um, but before they did anything, they would sit down, OK, what's the title of this song? What do we know about the characters before the song? And what do we want the characters to, to know about the characters after the song? What part of the plot needs to be told through this song? So, I mean, they had all of this together before Hammerstein went home to eastern Pennsylvania, where he lived, and sat down to write the lyrics. Um, it was a difficult process for him. 
Um, it could take him days. It could take him weeks to write a song. Um, the soliloquy from Carousel, which of course is a very complicated musical scene. He spent three weeks on that. And Rogers was actually a very fast worker. These men were never great friends. They were wonderful collaborators, and they stood behind each other in terms of their business, their very successful business, as great partners. But there was always just a little bit of, you know, Rogers would say, why does it take him so long to write a song? And then he'd send him the lyric, and Rogers would set it sometimes in an hour. But what Rogers, I mean, first of all, Rogers was an extremely fertile writer. Second of all, he said, I already knew what was coming. We'd already talked about the whole thing. I'd already kind of thought what the music was going to be like. And then he'd say to, I mean, the biggest praise he'd give to Oscar would be something like, oh, it works. Well, you know, when you've poured your life into something, it's a little hard to say, oh, yes, that works. Gee, thanks, Dick. I really appreciate that. So, you know, you read about complaints. But anyway. Whether they're good friends or not, I mean, they were laughing all the way to the banks they owned. I mean, these guys were just about the biggest commercial successes in the history of the Broadway musical. Um, they basically would premiere one of their own shows every other year in odd years. That didn't break down. I mean, they started in 43, and they had shows in 43, 45, 47, 49, 51, 53, 55, and the next one was 58. So it was their second to last show, Flower Drum Song. They'd finally waited a year, but that was partly because uh, Rogers had cancer of the jaw. Um, you can imagine being operated on that in 1957. But anyway, of course, they were also making money hand over fist. And what do you do? Well, you invest more of it in Broadway. So they started producing other people's shows. They were, for example, the producing team that put on Annie Get Your Gun, originally intended for uh, Jerome Kern. But Kern died in 1945, and Irving Berlin wrote the score. Um, contractually, they insisted on writing everything. They wanted to own every aspect of their shows. Um, there's only a couple of shows, which will we go through the review, that um, Hammerstein did not write the book for. Uh, but usually, you know, Rogers wrote all the music except for the dances. And, I mean, in Broadway, we do have specialists, and one of those specialists is a dance arranger who will work with the choreographer to take the music from the show and figure out the music with the choreographer. It'll still all be songs by Rogers, but someone else works that out. The dance arranger, most Broadway shows have had dance arrangers. In Rogers' case, it was a German composer named Trudy Rittman. Uh, it's fairly early for a woman to be doing this on Broadway. It's kind of interesting. Actually, another was a dance arranger named Gen Genevieve Pitot. We keep running into men when we're dealing with these things in the 40s and 50s. But some of the less lucrative aspects of this, women did manage to get into. Trudy Rittman was a genius. And Rogers loved working with her. But you know, some, every once in a while, she'd be doing something and say, no, that's not me. That's you. This is by Rogers, not Rittman. But um, you know, the 15-minute a, a dream ballet in Oklahoma. She took the music and adapted it. That's her composition using Rogers' themes. Um, you know, when we talk about their shows, there, there is a, a style, there is what they were doing um, in terms of uh, the, the, the way they changed the musical and their influence. The first would be a deep level of integration between the songs, the dance, and the plot. This had been coming. Rogers and Hart were interested in it. We find it in, on, in Hammerstein's work with Kern and others before this. But in um, Rogers and Hammerstein, it really goes to the next level. And everything that's going on in that show, they wanted to be helping to tell a story. And I say this to people today. They say, well, isn't that what goes on in shows? Not in the 1920s and 30s. It ne was not necessarily. It's Rogers and Hammerstein that make this more important. The use of serious stories. I keep saying musical play. You know, musical comedy, yeah, Oklahoma. There are certainly elements in the musical comedy in Oklahoma. There's also some dead bodies. Dead bodies aren't funny. Um, Judd is not a funny character. Judd is a psychopath. Um, you hear him sing Lonely Room, and you realize you have left the musical comedy behind. You're in a new world, and of course, it's a world based on opera. Now, it's not an operatic voice, it's not an operatic aria, but still, using music to help tell those serious stories, it's not a new idea. It's been going off for 300 and some years in opera. But, um, and they're not writing operas, but they are writing shows that are far more serious. Um, character development, very, I mean, deep characters. These characters, many of them, I mean, the main characters, they come popping off the stage or popping off the screen. They're people we feel like we kind of know them. 
They're not cardboard cutouts that you carry around on the stage. Um, very strong female characters, fascinating aspect of their shows. Almost every one of them has at least one strong female character in it. Very effective use of reprises, in other words, bringing a song back. In the, you know, in the first act, there's Curly in uh, Oklahoma, there's Curly and uh, uh, Lori singing, people will say we're in love. We gotta be careful that people are gonna say we're in love. Everybody else knows it but them, but they get it figured out later on. At the end, that song becomes, let them say, let people say we're in love. Wonderful use of a reprise. And through these kind of things, they popularize the musical play. The notion of Broadway telling more serious stories becomes more of a possibility. They did nine Broadway shows, and five of them could be described as hits. That's a huge percentage, um, and most of the others were at least somewhat successful. Um, they also did the music for the film State Fair, 1945, and of course, um, Cinderella on television in 1957 for a very young Julie Andrews, who at the same time was doing My Fair Lady. Isn't it nice to be young to be doing a big show and rehearsing a television show during the day? Um, so as I said, they both kind of had bad experiences in, on, in Hollywood, so they, they insisted on owning and having you know, final say on all of their films. I mean, the first film didn't come until 1955. Well, there was State Farm, but that wasn't their, the state, not State Farm, State Fair. It was not an insurance company, <laughs> I assure you. Um, but uh, Oklahoma did not reach film until 1955, 12 years after it opened on Broadway. But that was because it toured for over 10 years. And they were draining out the touring money before they actually made the film. So some of those, of course, remain quite famous today. Um, I've got a poster or something from each one of these shows. Some of them I've used the uh, British poster. The uh, Tito Royale of Drury Lane. They dominated the Drury Lane for nine years. Nine consecutive years. Oklahoma, Carousel, South Pacific are playing at the Drury Lane in London. Uh, they were very successful in the, um, in the British market. Um, so, Oklahoma, yeah, we've got, we've got musical comedy, my goodness, we've got Adu, Annie, and Will, I mean, they're sharing half a brain between them. Um, very funny, you know, very funny couple. And then we have Lori and Curly, and they, you know, they're trying to, they're doing this dance, trying to figure out, and then there's Judd. So, I mean, uh, that, that's not musical comedy. Lots of use of ballet to help tell the story. This becomes a mark in their work, but it's not there all the time. The two shows that use ballet the most are the first two, Oklahoma and Carousel. Um, and then, you know, Broadway historians, you know, a lot, a lot of them talk about, well, you want to talk about musicals? Well, there's B.O. before Oklahoma, and there is P.O. post-Oklahoma, or A.O., or whatever. And it's true. I mean, this show had more, um, bigger sets of integration than most shows did during the day. There, were, there weren't a lot of new elements in it. What was new was the way they'd combined it all and the way it all worked. I mean, this show was perceived as something new during its day, and we still basically see it that way. And that run of 2,212 performances was the longest run for a musical up to that time. There were plays that had run longer, but uh, like Life with Father in the 1930s. But, Oklahoma was enormously successful, and of course it remains in the repertory. Um, lots of things one can say about Oklahoma, but that of course isn't what we're dealing with today. Except briefly. Their second show, Carousel, also was owned by the Theater Guild. The Theater Guild had put on this Hungarian play by Ferenc Molnar. Uh, the, the, the play was, uh, um, I mean, his play, they, they had put it on in New York, and it took place in Hungary, and they brought it forward, and Rogers and Aberstein's first reaction was, what do we do with a Hungarian play? And one of the, Teresa, Teresa Halbern, who was one of the, the owners of the Theater Guild, said, why don't you put it in Louisiana? And Hammerstein's reaction was, I am not writing for that accent. Forget it. It's just not going to happen. So they took, they took it to New England instead, which, of course, is another interesting accent. But anyway, 
it's a very, I mean, if Oklahoma you know, had some new ground that it covered in it with characters like Judd, this one, I mean, this story is not an easy, I mean, it's not an easy play, let alone something easy to musicalize. I mean, this is Billy Bigelow. Billy Bigelow, he runs a carousel, a job he loses at the beginning of the show, and uh, Julie, who he ends up marrying, loses her job at the beginning of the show. It's a highly dysfunctional relationship. Billy really can't do anything right. He's a, he beats his wife. Um, he dies at the end of the first act. He's got a knife. He's supposed to be helping with the robbery. The robbery's not going well, so he stabs himself and dies at the end of the first act. The second act, he's trying to get into heaven. The second act goes right to fantasy land. And um, he, you know, he, he, he manages to come back. What he's doing here, she can't see him, but he's, he's telling her to please believe that I loved you. This is, this is Julie. Um, the woman that he married, but she, this is 15 years later. Well, actually, it's 18 years later. His daughter's graduating from uh, high school right here. So it's a, it's a pretty problematic story. Dance was just as important in this as it had been in Oklahoma. It didn't run nearly as long. It was also Roger's favorite score. That man wrote over 40 scores for Broadway, and Carousel was his favorite, and it's pretty spectacular. But it also is a, it, you know, it, it's a gnarly show. It, it's one that that takes some thinking. Their next one was too experimental. It was called Allegro. Um, it's barely been done since. It ran 315 performances, which isn't bad, but that's not you know, Rodgers and Hammerstein's best. It was an original story, small town doctor, um, who basically, he's married to a woman who's a social climber. She gets him to move to the city. Their marriage breaks up. He marries a nurse and moves back to where he had started his practice. It's kind of one of those things from the middle of the 20th century that says, boy, the best life in America is in the small town. It was that sort of, I mean, there were just you know, hundreds of movies like that, and novels, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, the, the, but it was a very, again, a very experimental show. There's not, some of the songs in it are very short. Um, you kind of got a Greek chorus, that is, you know, the, a chorus singing, which is helping to tell the story. Um, throughout. It was directed and choreographed by Agnes DeMille, who had done the choreography for both Oklahoma and Carousel. Again, it wasn't terribly successful. Um, Hammerstein was thinking about rewriting it late in his life, you know, but he died before he really got a chance. But it's the kind of show which later on you start getting more shows like this. It might have been before its time. It might also not have been topped Roy Rogers and Hammerstein. I have listened to score. I've read the, I've never had a chance to see it. There is no film. Um, but uh, the score itself, I don't know. Melodically, it's, it's certainly not Rogers' best work. And as I said, a lot of the songs are really quite short. Um, and then you go on to something else. It feels very different than a lot of their other work. South Pacific, of course, didn't have any problem with being a success. Um, it was a huge success. It ran going on 2,000 performances. Mary Martin, rather interesting casting of the Italian basso baritone Ezio Pinza as Emile de Beck. What was amazing about this show is its approach to race. This is 1949. There have been a few films that had taken on race as an American problem. But we're writing in a commercial medium here. Yes, I realize films are too, but we're also before the civil rights movement is really getting started, which just happens in the early 1950s. But this was a show where both of the main couples, um, I mean, they weren't dealing with African Americans. They were using other races as substitutes for African Americans. But the meaning of the show is perfectly blunt. And of course, you have that song, You've Got to Be Carefully Taught which some of the people would, who, you know, other producers would come and sit in on rehearsals and they'd walk up to Rogers and Hammerstein, you gotta get rid of that song. Nobody's gonna wanna hear that song. That's why we wrote the show. They were taking a decent commercial risk here, but the, the work, I mean, it's such solid work that it just, you know, it ran for a long time. And of course the film was also very successful. It was based on short stories by uh, on young James Minchner. Minchner got a quarter of a percent of the gross at this show, and that's why James Minchner was able to quit his job as an editor and start writing all those other books. You can thank South Pacific for that. Um, and uh, of course, Mary Martin, you know, several big starring roles on Broadway, including later The Sound of Music, but uh, a, a really one, a, a top drawer score. And then another very successful show in 1951, The King and I. Um, 
you know, the king and I, of course, we're, we're talking about, you know, American writing about Asians. And there are some people today who find this a bit offensive. Um, it was 1951. Nobody you know, didn't bother anybody. If you wanted to write exotic music, you just use somewhat different scales, score it a little different. It doesn't matter to Rogers that it's not music from Siam. Um, it is a it is a well told story with some really memorable characters in it. it wasn't actually R and H's idea. It was her idea. Gertrude Lawrence, big star from the 1920s to the 1950s. Um, she liked the novel Anna and the King by Margaret Landon, and the, it just been made into a film with Rex Harrison as the king. And um, she starred in it, and a very young Ewell Brenner starred in it. Gertrude Lawrence was a trooper. She died of pancreatic cancer a few months or weeks, I forget what it is, after she left the show. She was dying of pancreatic cancer, and then finally said, I can't go on. What's wrong? I'm dying. Nobody knew. Well, she dies, and all of a sudden, the name above the title became Yule Brenner. And of course, this became Yule Brenner's show. He played it, I believe, 5,000 times during the course of his life. Very well-known piece, ran for a good three years on Broadway. And it's, you know, again, we're looking at a musical play. This is the couple, and they're in the main, you know, and they're in the big scene, Shall We Dance? But this couple can never become a couple. It's a complicated dance all the way through the show between these two very memorable characters. A show we don't know very well at all, Me and Juliet. It was sort of their attempt to write a musical comedy. It was a backstage show. Um, and, uh, but they couldn't keep it from becoming serious in some ways. Um, Isabel Bigley and Bill Hayes were the star. Um, there was a... Uh, a romance triangle going on, and during the course of the show, the uh, guy who's in charge of the set tries to kill <laughs> the other man. So it still has some pretty strong moments in it. Um, the, the biggest hit song was No Other Love, which is one of the famous themes also used in Victory at Sea by Richard Rodgers just about the time he was writing this show. It was directed by George Abbott. The dates are right there. He was 107, and he was still working on Broadway when he died at 107. His career only lasted, poor man, 83 years. Um, but he was one of the masters of musical comedy, and he directed this. And there were some very frustrating moments because he wasn't quite sure what to do with it in places. Ran 358 performances nearly a year. Pipe Dream. This is based upon Sweet Thursday, which was a sequel to Cannery Row by John Steinbeck. So we're talking about a, uh, a house of prostitution where everyone was really nice, and they're doing they're 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 on you know they're they're there in Monterey, California, in a very poor area. And part of this story is you've got a marine biologist. He doesn't have a university appointment, and he needs a new microscope. So the prostitutes are helping him get a new microscope. And I mean, they wrote the show, and Steinbeck was pretty happy with it. Um, and then it, it started, it went out of town, and they started changing it because they were getting nervous about the story. And in places, it's kind of like, you know, well, Steinbeck supposedly, I mean, he actually wrote him, he was writing notes once, and he said, guys, it's either a whorehouse or it's not. <laughs> you know? Um, so that 246 performances was the advance sale. <laughs> there was hardly another ticket purchased, it ran six months. And it was gone, well, seven months. Um, that's OK. You don't have, you know, not every show is going to be The Sound of Music or South Pacific. It's a lot more I could say about it, but we don't have time for that this evening. Um, then, of course, you have Cinderella, which was written for Julie Andrews, although that was in black and white, not in color. Um, but uh, this was said to be, be seen by 100 million people at a time when the population of the United States was 140, 145 million. It was the most watched show in television history until some Super Bowl several years ago. Um, very well, I mean, very well written and done absolutely live. Flower Drum Song, another show about Asians. This one took place in the Chinese uh, immigrant community in San Francisco. Um, Hammerstein wrote the book with Joseph Fields. And it had, it had a really nice score. 100 Million Miracles was one of the songs. Um, and uh, I Love Being a Girl was a very popular song that came out of this song, very memorably by Pat Suzuki. This was actually the uh, London uh, recording. 
But um, we ran 600 performances. It's not a show you could really put on very easily today. Um, the, playwright, the playwright David Henry Wong did write a new book for it in 2002, which was the last time it was done in New York. Then, of course, we get to Sound of Music. Um, this was inspired by a German film called, in German, of course, The Trap Family. Um, it came to the attention of Mary Martin and Richard Halliday, who her was her husband, was a producer. Um, and they really wanted to put the show on. And their thinking was, yes, there will be a lot of singing, and it will be what the Trap family sang, which was Mozart, Palestrina. Um, an awful lot of what they sang was Roman Catholic religious music and Austrian folk songs. And they went to Rogers and Hammerstein and said, would you just write a few songs for this? And Rogers said, basically, if you think I'm writing music in competition with Palestrina and Mozart, you're crazy. Um, we would be interested in writing the show, but we're not, you know, we're not using their music. Well, they were waiting, they were ready to wait, they were willing to wait for a year for Rodgers and Hammerstein, because they were still working on Flower Drum Song when they came to them. So they finally get into the show in 1959. Um, and uh, I mean, the show played 1,443 performances. That's over three years on Broadway. It ran twice that long in London. It got to London and the critics go, oh, it's so sentimental. Oh, those kids. Oh, it's, it's just like, it's like, oh, it's like sugar. And everybody went to see it 12 times. I mean, that's been the story of this show. You know, critics don't like sentiment, although musicals are often sentimental. Critics don't like kids. They don't like Christmas. They want hard hitting, interesting stuff. And the audience often loves that sentiment and loves those kids. And you know that's what's kept this show going all these years. And then, of course, there was this 1965 film you might have heard of, which you know at one point was the biggest grossing film in the ent entire history of Hollywood. Um, I mean, I re you know, as I said, I saw the film. I remember I lived in Louisville, Kentucky at the time. There was a, there was a theater it played at for two years. Um, ridiculously successful film. Um, Okay, they'd already, t uh, Mary Martin and her husband had already discussed the play with Russell Krauss and uh, Hal Lindsey. They wrote Life with Father. I mean, these, this was a, an important Broadway writing team, mostly with plays. Um, and so the idea was they were going to write the book all along, and that was apparently fine with Hammerstein. It's the only book that he didn't, um, that, he, that he didn't write any of. South Pacific, he also worked with Joshua Logan on the book, who directed it. There are some similarities with the plot of The King and I. You have, you know, a, it's, it's not a teacher, but it's a governess going to be with some children. And there's, you know, there's, there's a, a difficult figure there that she has to deal with. Um, and of course, it's taking place in Austria, which is an exotic location. And Rogers manages to write songs like Edelweiss that there are people who to this day swear is an Austrian folk song. It is not. It was the last song that Rogers ever wrote lyrics to. It was a terrific score. You know, there's just so many songs that are memorable in this score and really do help tell the story. It became real well known outside the production. So Mary Martin, of course, played Maria. She was too old to play Maria. She was in her 40s at that point. Of course, Maria is a young woman. Not that 40 is an old woman, but still, Maria would have been 21, 22 years old. Um, but it's on stage. Nobody cared. It was Mary Martin. Nobody cared. Theodore Bickell was the uh, um, was the uh, played the ca uh, the captain. Um, he was actually from Vienna. Later on, he he he, he played Tevia on stage more than any other actor. Uh, but this was his first work on Broadway. Um, the story, of course, was very heavily adapted. The story that is told in Sound of Music is far more dramatic than the truth. They were not running away over the mountains. Besides, it's what, 150 miles to Switzerland over high Alps? You can't do that. Not, certainly not with seven children, and certainly not with one on your shoulders the whole way. So, um, I mean, what really happened in real life and what happens in the show is not exactly the same thing. But ladies and gentlemen, there has never been any story adapted for a musical, a film, or a television show where they didn't make it more dramatic. Life just doesn't come in nice, easy, dramatic bits. Um, as I said, this was, uh, and the, 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 the show was actually rather different than the film, and not just a little different than the film. Um, it's, the politics are a whole lot more important in the show. 
In the show, you've got this song, No Way to Stop It, where the Baroness, Max, and the captain are singing about the coming Anschluss, the German annexation of Austria. And the Baroness and Max are saying, you just, you just got to let it happen. You can't fight this. There's no way to stop it. And you get to the end of that song, and the Baroness says to the captain, well, I think I know where this is going, right? Um, you're, are you interested in me? Not if you're interested in them. The breakup is really over the politics. She never says, I don't think she'll ever be a nun. I mean, Maria was there, and he was falling in love with Maria, but it wasn't, it's not the same. In this, it's really the Baroness is, you know, just kind of dismissed out of his life over the politics. That the politics are really downplayed in the film. Um, as I've already said, this was, you know, this was Hammerstein's health was crashing as they were working on the show. The New York City opening was no November 16, 1959. At that point, he'd had surgery. They couldn't get all the cancer. And they'd already told him he had about six months left to live. And he died in June of 1960. Just a photograph from the original. And you know, remember, you're going to see the stage show. Don't take the film with you. <laughs> There's a lot of differences. The songs come in different places for different reasons. There's a lot of differences between the stage show and the film. And in fact, when you put this show on, you sign a contract with the Rodgers and Hammerstein people that says, we're putting on the stage show, not the film. Rodgers and Hammerstein have been known to send out, or the, their organization been known to send out spies to see what's going on in that production. And if you put in scenes like they're in the film and move the songs around, you're in violation of the contract because you don't own the rights to this, they do, and you're supposed to put on what they tell you to. Here, of course, they're singing in the final concert which does happen in both. I'm not saying that it's completely different, but the songs get sung in different places. Um, there are also some different songs. Um, the song, it's a wonderful song for, again, those three, Max, the captain, and the Baroness. They sing a song called How Can Love Survive? It's mostly Max and the Baroness, but the, the captain's there because they're rich. <laughs> the song's about how most famous lovers are poor. How, do you, how does love survive when you're rich? Also, the love song in the second act between the Baron, excuse me, between the captain and Maria is called, in the original stage show, it's called An Ordinary Couple. It's not a high energy number. Um, obviously, for the film, they decided they wanted something else, and they've got something good, which isn't a high energy number either, but it's, it's, a, it's a rather different song. Music and lyrics by Rogers, because it was Hammerstein was, was gone at that point. Um, Rogers also wrote a new song for Julie Andrews called I Have Confidence in Me. She's going to need it um, as she's going over to meet the family. Other songs are placed in new situations for the film. The Lonely Goat Herd, there's no nice marionette, you know, the marionettes and everything. It's a wonderful scene. You can do it on film because you can have close-ups of the marionettes. Can't do that on stage. So The Lonely Goat Herd is actually the song that she sings with the children during the storm. Um, instead of My Favorite Things, and one of the famous songs from the show. My Favorite Things, she actually sings with the Reverend Mother in the show. It's quite shocking if you've never seen the show or haven't really thought about this much. She's going off to become a nanny, um, and she sings this song with the Reverend Mother because it's a song that they both remember from childhood as the Reverend Mother is trying to uh, break it to her easily that she's being thrown out of the convent for the time being. She's going to become the governess for seven children. Um, anyway, of course, she sings it with the children during the storm. So, you know, you've got to watch out for these differences. And I've already talked about what happens is when you buy a license to do this show. But the film is um, obviously far more famous. Um, the songs. Um, I don't have time to talk about all of these. They're, they're on the uh, PowerPoint if you'd like to see what it says, which is going to be made available on the web. Um, but just briefly, um, you have like the preludium. There is music for a Roman Catholic choir of nuns to sing in this show that Rogers maybe wrote. <laughs> he went to Manhattanville College where he knew, the, where he knew one of the nuns. Um, and they actually did a concert for him so he could hear some of this music. Uh, there's somebody who thinks they found some of that music in the output of Orlando de Lassus, who was a 16th century Renaissance composer. I have not done any research on this myself. It wouldn't surprise me, though. It's very different than anything Rogers ever wrote. But I'm sure it's nothing more than an adaptation. 
The Sound of Music, I mean, the title song is just wonderful. And the show is about the power of music. The show is about, you know, she's, you know, she's trying, she's showing her love for nature here and how she's making her final commitment that she really wants to be a nun. The song Maria, you know, wonderful song about the nun singing about how Maria will, she'll never be a nun. And then, of course, you have my, fa my favorite things, which I've already talked about, which became one of the most famous songs for jazz improvisation after this show. The jazz artists love it, especially John Coltrane did. Do, Re, Mi, there's never been a more famous song come out of a Broadway show. 16 going on 17 which of course gets that wonderful repeat prise in the second act, sings it in the first act with Rolf in the second act. Liesel, the oldest child, sings it with uh, Maria as she's saying, you need to wait a little while. Lonely Goat Herd, we've already talked about some. How Can Love Survive, I've already mentioned. There's a reprise of The Sound of Music, which the children sing for the Baroness, which is also a famous scene in the film and just shocks the father out of his, you know, this, you know, this martinet that he's become since his wife had died. Um, the fact that his children are singing is very important to him. Um, the Len Lear, of course, is Captain Maria dancing. They st this is where Maria starts to notice, ooh, I, I'm, I'm, I have a very strange feeling with this guy. And then Brigitte says, I think you two are falling in love. Well, she runs back to the... Uh, um, to the convent, of course, where, of course, we get the, 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 uh, our Reverend Mother singing the anthemic song, uh, Climb Every Mountain, not unlike uh, When You Walk Through a Storm from Carousel. Um, no Way to Stop It, I've already mentioned. Um, an Ordinary Couple, I've already mentioned. The Processional, I love the wedding march. My daughter actually just got married to this wedding march in September. She's loved the show for a long time. But we did not have anyone singing, how do you solve a problem like Caitlin, uh, while she was marching up the aisle. Um, 16 going on 17 in the reprise. Um, I went the wrong way. And um, this is just, I mean, th this is a quotation from me, sort of the, the theme of this. Because again, critics have often been caustic about the sentiment of this show. But you know, wonderful score, wonderfully integrated songs and audiences have tended to love it. Brooks Atkinson, writing the New York Times about the show and the original review, the best of the sound of music is Rodgers and Hammerstein in good form. Mr. Rodgers has not written with such freshness of style since The King and I. That's nine years before, eight years. Mr. Hammerstein has contributed lyrics that also have the sentiment and dexterity of his best work. His review was actually mixed. He mostly criticizes this as being, it's like one of those old operettas. Well. No, it's not. But it takes place in Austria. The music's really important. Some of the music sounds like it's written for trained voices. You know, um, I, I've never really bought the comparison of this thing to an operetta. It, it doesn't strike me as that close. And I just love this story. As the show closed in New York City and prepared to tour, Mary Martin was part of the preview audience and discovered the show's emotional appeal. She'd played it for two years on Broadway, but she'd never seen it. At the intermission, we couldn't find Mary. She was down on all fours, feeling around on the floor where she'd been sitting. Russell, that's Russell Krauss, who wrote one, who's one of the writers of the book, said, Mary, what's the matter? She said, I've cried my lens out. She'd been playing it night after night, and she never knew what effect it was what it, that it had on the audience. And it does. It's an emotional show, and it's, it's a very satisfying one. And I expect we're going to see a terrific, wonderful production. And I'd be glad to entertain your questions at this point. Yeah. Just an observation, actually, about the film, really. Um, the song Something, uh, what is it, Something Good? Mm -hmm. The melody reminds me a lot of uh, I Enjoy Being a Girl. Have you ever noticed that? I enjoy mm -hmm. somewhere in my youth or childhood. Yeah, yeah, there, there, there can be, there's a comparison to be made there. Yeah, there's a comparison. I'm not sure I'd call it the same melody, but I, I, but some parts of it are. My ear training teacher, when I was a freshman, said, there's only 12 notes. Every once in a while, things are going to sound similar. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, you know, you write enough songs, you're going to have some comparisons that can be made. Sure, I can buy that. Absolutely. You're welcome. Excuse welcome. Me, dinner, but thank you so much. Any questions or comments? Yes? I'm not quite sure how to ask this question. I've always, uh, I was struck by 
uh, Roger, or, uh, Oscar Hammerstein worked on Shoba. He said mm -hmm. he, he was a lyricist, I presume. For both lyricist, books. he also wrote the book. Okay. So I always think of that era of Broadway as George and Cowan. So I'm kind of curious uh, why he often isn't thought of as the, maybe he is, as the, if you will, the, the post showboat Broadway uh, style okay. of musical. Hammerstein, you mean? No. No, Cohen. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it was more... Was well, Co Cohen uh, is absolutely the major figure in the popularizing of the musical comedy in the early 20th century. Um, he was brilliant at that. I mean, how many guys have, you know, he wrote the play, he wrote the book, he wrote the lyrics, he wrote the music, he starred in it, he established the male lead as a dancing figure in musical comedies. Um, he, offered, he directed his shows, he choreographed them. Um, I mean, there's very few figures who have done that much and done it that well. Um, but we're talking there the musical comedy. Um, his shows, yes, they told stories. Yes, the songs often helped tell the story. Sometimes they didn't. Um, it, was, it was a different time. And if you tried to put on a Cohen show today, the audience would not get it. It's just, it, it, it's in a totally different style. Um, as I said, you know, song introductions at the time sometimes was just, well, we just want to do a good song here. I mean, the musical comedy at that time, it existed, um, you know, obviously for singing actors who could also dance a bit, although it wasn't as important then as it became later. Um, it was for popularizing songs and um, some dance styles, but the, the sense of integration that we expect in our shows just wasn't there. And if you saw it today, it would be, I mean, most people, they, they just wouldn't get it. Um, but no, in terms of the musical comedy, um, Cohen, Cohen was the most important figure. Um, was setting that up for people like Rodgers and Hart, the Gershwin brothers, Cole Porter, um, the next generation that came along, of course. So, so that's really interesting, the context of why would that be? So I, I imagine the war, uh, the era between the wars might have been a factor in this evolution. Um, or something other, some other cultural show? I mean, the, this move towards a musical play? Well, the, no, I mean, sort of like the, the, the shows where we wouldn't understand because it's just a series of songs, and sometimes a story, maybe not, versus what we kind of expect today. And what well, we expect I, it, it, was a, it was certainly a movement more towards art instead of just commercial work. But I mean, you know, my, my favorite story about how important the stories were in the 1920s and 30s musicals has to do with Anything Goes. Anything Goes, the, music, the score was all written by Cole Porter. Brilliant score. They already had a book written. It was about a shipwreck. Now, why a shipwreck is funny, I'm not sure, but it sure as heck wasn't funny when the Morro Castle sank and burned off the coast of New Jersey and 135 people died. So the producers go, we need a new book. They hired somebody else, they threw out the book, kept all of the songs, and wrote a new book around it. And it worked, you know, because what people loved were Cole Porter's great songs. I mean, the, 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 you know, the, the, the stories about Public Enemy 13, and I, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. But it works for that, but presumably the book before that had worked as well. Um, it's just, I mean, shows like Showboat, in Oklahoma rewrote what the musical was going to be. And people have been writing him for a long time. After Rodgers and Hammerstein came along, I mean, Irving Berlin, when they asked him to write, The King and I, he said, I, I, not The King and I, excuse me, uh, Annie, get your gun. He said, I've never written a show like that. I mean, my songs have never been that integral. Well, you can do it, go ahead. Cole Porter felt the same way. Then, of course, he managed to write Kiss Me Kate, which was just fine. They could make the, you know, they could adapt. And then by 1950, you got Frank Lesser writing Guys and Dolls, which is a wonderful musical comedy. But those songs, the songs, you can practically tell the whole story with those songs. It's just tastes changed. I, I, I think it's more just a matter of people's taste changing. And they, you know, shows like Showboat and then Oklahoma Carousel become really popular. And that's the kind of shows they're looking for. And of course, we, you know, we sort of still have that feeling today. Yeah. I wonder how much uh, crossover or how little crossover there uh, was between grand opera fans and uh, the way musical comedy has changed, uh, and ballet for that matter. Well, I mean, um, what, you, you talked about popular taste. Yeah. You know, that's elite taste, is that right? 
read yeah, that. Yeah, it is, but of course it was it was different back then too because I mean, you know, had opera on the radio. I know we still do, but you know, it was listened to a whole lot more back then. I mean, I, the audience was larger, relatively speaking, um, and you know, major opera stars were were well known. They also made films. People like Grace Moore. Um, I, I would argue that that opera doesn't really start to become only an elite entertainment in this country until after the Second World War. Um, it's, yeah, it's mostly paid for by rich people, but the music was known by a larger slice of the population than it is today. And attended by rich people? or public? Well, yeah, well, the tickets were expensive, you know, so yeah, it's mostly attended by rich people. But my, my, my sense, you know, from what I, I know of the period is that, you know, the opera melodies were better. Well, I mean, just think, for example, Warner Brothers cartoons of the 1930s and 1940s. I mean, what's opera doc? That's popular culture. You can't make a satire like that unless people know the model. You show that today, most people don't know what they're looking at. And that's not the only cartoon like about that by, uh, you know, there's also, what is it, The Rabbit of Seville, which is based on The Barber of Seville. That music was known more by the general population than it is today. It really was. Um, and uh, how that bled into the musical, I, 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 I'm not, I don't, you know, I just don't know if the same person were going, people were going to see those shows. Ballet becomes more popular in the 1930s because of the New Deal. All of a sudden, there's more ballet companies. And you know, once ballet starts to become more popular, it starts to appear on Broadway. It, it doesn't start appearing on Broadway until the second half of the 1930s. So there you get that high, you know, that, that high culture thing, or high brow, if you will, falling down in the middle brow. Because, I mean, musical, you know, musicals are usually thought of more as a middle brow thing, although middle brow is certainly in the eye of the beholder. But uh, ballet, ballet becomes more popular in the 30s, and Rodgers and Hammerstein pick it up. Again, they don't use it a whole lot after Carousel. Anything else? Yes, sir. I don't know how to say this, but how do you, how would you contrast or between Mary Martin and Julie Andrews? And I, I got what you said previously about the differences in the, in the play, in the, in, yeah. the, in the musicals. But how would you contrast those two individuals? Well, I, I mean, I think they're really totally different performers. Um, just as a singer, for example, Mary Martin had an upper extension. She, she could sing high, but you know, mostly she belted. Um, she was usually working in the lower range, and that's where they wrote for her most of the time. Um, Julie Andrews, of course, you know, she is a soprano who, who I, I doubt she actually belts. Most sopranos don't. They learn to sing in a way that sounds like belting without actually doing it. But uh, um, so, I, I mean, they're, they're very different singers. Um, Mary Martin was, you know, just a, a wonderful stage figure. I mean, there was, there was just charisma there to burn. Not that Julie Andrews wasn't, but the characters they played, for the most part, were quite different. It's a little hard to imagine uh, Mary Martin, for example, playing Eliza Doolittle, you know. Well, she wasn't British to begin with, but um, I, I've, I've, I've always found them quite different as performers. I, you know, I don't think you have to be all that similar to play the same role. Julie Andrews did it rather differently. So specifically, they both had albums that were produced, and both of them sang in the, on these albums. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to. I don't want to choose one over the other. I, what I, what well, I would like is your comment about one or the other. Um, I, I well, I, I I prefer Julie Andrews as a singer. Um, that's just my own personal feeling. I don't, I don't, I, I, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, that, that is the, I mean, obviously it is the film. And I don't, I, it wouldn't surprise me if they took some of the tunes up for Julie Andrews because her, her, her range was a little, I don't know that as a fact. I'd really have to compare the two albums. I've never done that. But uh, it's just, you know, that these are very different approaches. I mean, you know, Mary Martin during, uh, do re mi, you know, at the end she goes, do ti la so fa mi re do. 
Yeah. And then this kid's got, pow! Well, Julie Andrews couldn't have done that if her life depended on it. Her voice didn't go down like that. Um, but uh, they're, 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 very, they're very different approaches to the songs. Um, Mary Martin sort of went for cuteness. Julie Andrews, there's you know there's there's more of a there's more of a of a melodic lilt there. I just you know I find her to be a, a very different performer. Um, it's hard it, you know it, to me it's kind of like apples and Chevrolets. You know it's it's two di very different things. Um, and of course I never saw Mary Martin do the role. I've only stood, there's very little film of her doing this. Very little. Um, most of what I've seen of her live uh, was uh, some television stuff she did in the 1950s. It was a special with Ethel Merman. Um, for, <laughs> you can get, I mean, it's incredible to see the two of those performing together. Um, but she, she was a, had very different appeal than Julie Andrews. Yes, sir. Is there any difference in the way the Nazis are portrayed between the play and the movie? Um, you know, they're pretty mean in both. Um, but uh, they're mostly just mean in the movie. It's almost told sort of, it seems to be almost more from the kid's perspective. Um, in the film, in, in, in the show, um, as I said, that the politics is talked about more. I mean, you know, and these rich people are singing, there's no way to stop it. They know that if they oppose the Nazis, they're ruined. The Nazis will take everything they have. That kind of thing's not talked about in the film at all. Um, it's, a, it's, it's just a, you know, it's a different approach to, to how to do that. But um, in the in the in the show, I, I, the Nazis are a little bit you know they're a little scarier politically anyway. Anything else? Well, thank you kindly for your attention. Enjoy the opera, or the operetta, or the musical play, or whatever we want to call it. <laughs>